the M4 Sherman, the most iconic American tank in history. On film, the Sherman is featured in a number of strange ways, some that do this tank justice, and others that are straight out of science fiction. Let's take a closer look at this beautiful tank and some of the movies it's featured in. All right, let's move them out. When filming large tank battles, it can be a challenge finding reserves of period authentic tanks. Studios for movies like Patton or The Battle of the Bulge wanted large set piece battles, and this meant filming in budget friendly Spain, where numerous Chaffee tanks and M47 and 48 Patton tanks were available, as well as the crews trained to operate them. Commence firing, fired will. Commence firing, fired will. Commence firing, fired will. For tank movies filming in the 1960s onwards, few armies were using Shermans available to studios. Yugoslavia and Israel were two such exceptions that continued to use Shermans well into the Cold War era. Yugoslavia at the time of filming Kelly's Heroes still had active M4A3 Shermans with their 76mm guns, and this was not lost on the production team who wanted the movie to be as authentic as possible. Okay, fire! The production team for Big Red One was also able to procure several real Shermans from the Israeli Defense Force, though they were highly anachronistic for World War II, being M51 Shermans with their massive French 105mm guns, probably one of the most upgun Shermans to see modern military action. These M51 Shermans not only stand out as ridiculous amongst World War II Allied tanks, the movie went the extra mile and painted them to represent German panzers. Though the German army did occasionally capture American tanks, it's certainly interesting to see Germans driving Israeli armor. But let's focus on the Shermans that were actually used in World War II, and the best place to start is probably with the M3 Lee. The Sherman owes many of its design qualities and characteristics to the successes and shortcomings of this often forgotten tank. The M3 Lee was essentially a rush job, or stopgap tank, designed to immediately fit a gun capable of competing with the successful Panzer III's and IV's. The Americans had a good 75mm gun, but required time to develop a turret for it. The M3 Lee would be a compromise until the Sherman began mass production in mid-1942. The Lee validated the need for the Sherman. The M3 was highly vulnerable, as it had to expose the majority of its hull to use its main gun. Though the M3 would have success in Asia, and mixed success in Africa, it was rendered immediately obsolete by the Sherman. That being said, the Sherman owed its production success to the Lee. Factories were easily able to transition from the Lee to the Sherman, with almost no gaps in production, with Shermans literally rolling off the production line right behind the Lee. America would finally have a competitive tank. I've been waiting 25 years for this moment. Sahara from 1943, a wartime production, is the best place to watch the M3 Lee in action. The tank is basically the star of the movie. The film was also remade shot for shot in the 1995 TV film by the same name. Yo. At introduction, the Sherman was a highly competitive tank in all theaters. In Africa, and at the Second Battle of Al Alamein in 1942, Shermans proved themselves against German armor and crushed Italian tank designs. What was most crucial was that America could produce and support the Sherman in immediate and significant numbers to Africa and the Pacific. Oh great, it's here. That mirror I bought on eBay. Oh my god! <laughs> Arguably, the greatest design quality of the Sherman was its carefully selected weight and size. A Sherman was the ideal size for rail, landing craft, and the majority of cranes loading and unloading these tanks. Ease of transportation was essential. A Sherman manufactured in Pennsylvania could end up in Iwo Jima, a distance of 7,400 miles away, or even further. And once fighting in jungle terrain, the Sherman was about as large of a tank 
that could effectively maneuver. The Japanese had no effective tank to combat the Sherman, with infantry, mines, and artillery being the most effective weapon against them, along with a few unconventional weapons, like this 320mm mortar. By the time the Allies landed in France, the Sherman was outclassed by heavy German tanks and many German tank destroyers. Band of Brothers, which features several authentic Shermans, highlights the struggle against heavy German armor. This Sherman is an M4A1 Grizzly, by the way. Also noteworthy, the Tiger I mock-up used in Band of Brothers was used because it was available to the production team, not because American armor, in these specific instances, did encounter a Tiger I. During the Battle of the Bloody Gulch, again seen here in Band of Brothers, 60 American tanks, primarily Shermans, fought 12 Panzers. Despite this being an American victory, the German armor, severely outnumbered, suffered only minor losses and was able to slip away, which would become a norm for highly effective German ambush tactics against American armor. In Fury, the Sherman M4A2E8 represented a solution to German heavy armor. The E8 had a highly effective long 76mm gun, which could penetrate the frontal armor of Tigers and Panthers. Obviously this movie gets significant praise for featuring a tank engagement using authentic Shermans and a Tiger I, including detailed shots of the inside of a Sherman. Of course this movie also gets ravaged by tank critics for an engagement that can only be described as tactically bizarre. Many issues include the Tiger I advancing, despite having a clear range advantage and need to fire while stationary. The E8 Sherman also did not need to hit the Tiger from the rear to penetrate its armor. But they did a good visual job of the Sherman tank. Crews added logs and sandbags to their Shermans, which were not overly effective at adding armor, but did provide a false sense of confidence. Logs also could be used under tracks to gain traction in mud and made it harder to stick magnetic mines to the side of a tank. Some of the negatives of the Sherman was its high profile, a nice tall target for its size. Its armor was really only considered thin compared to German heavy tanks, whereas compared to the Panzer IV, the Sherman's armor was superior. One significant fault in early Shermans was a vulnerable ammo storage system, which helped perpetuate the myth of the Shermans exploding due to their petrol engines. Later war Shermans had additional armor to protect ammunition, as well as a wet stowage system. Man, this is the way to travel with a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of machinery under you. If we run into German Tigers, you won't think so. This thing's only got about four inches of armor. So was the Sherman a good tank? It was a good all-rounder, designed to be used in all theaters, and most importantly, shipped to all theaters. The Allies did an amazing job logistically with the Sherman. They could keep them supplied and had excellent dedicated repair and recovery teams. Shermans were also modified more than any other tank in World War II, with hedgerow cutters and wading modifications to traverse deep water, just to name a few of many examples. Don't hurt yourself. Nice ride you got here next. Great to get our beach. This is going to work before they're missed. The Sherman had a good speed of 20 to 30 miles per hour. They were mechanically reliable, and once upgunned, could face heavy German tanks if the correct tactics were used, which ideally involved numerical superiority, which by the end of the war, the Shermans frequently had. All right, I'm Johnny. Thanks for watching this brief amateur review on the Sherman and some of the movies it was featured in. As always, if you have some knowledge on the subject, Please share with the class in the comment section below, and we'll see you next time.